are part of uh, some of our members' efforts to participate in a national 26 acts of kindness to honor the memory of the victims of the Newtown, Connecticut uh, uh, disaster. Please pray for the families and any money left in the stockings will be donated direct, directly to the victims' families. And if you would like to contribute something during the week, we will take that in the office as well. We are glad that you're here. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives that as, once again, Christ may enter into our world.
morning. Please join me to the call of worship as printed in your bulletin. The hills and the mountains will be singing praise to God. Every tree in the forest will be clapping its hands. The Lord will come and rule forever. Alleluia. Now let's praise our God by singing hymn number 234, O Come All Ye Faithful. You may be seated. We welcome the Chriswell family to lead us in lighting the Advent wreath.
God's chosen people often turned away from the law and were less than faithful, yet they were still God's chosen people. Long before Christ was born, God made a promise to King David that his throne would be established forever through God's faithful love. On the night Christ came to earth, that promise was fulfilled. Out of the house of David, the Savior arose, a Savior given to redeem the whole world. God's love for us truly does endure forever, and in remembrance of God's mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we light the candle of love. Let us pray. Lord God, help us always to remember that we are redeemed through our belief in your Son. No matter how far we stray, you are always right there waiting for us, loving us. We rejoice in your steadfast love for all the people of the world, fulfilled in the birth of your Son, Jesus I do want to welcome everybody here today. I know we have several people visiting with us that are in for the Christmas celebration with their family. We are glad that you're here. I want to give a word of thanks to Roy um, today. If you notice things are a little bit different up here, there's a lot more red. And it's not because of a certain ball game next Saturday. Um, but I want to thank Roy for decorating and, and arranging the poinsettia, poinsettias. It's a beautiful setting and we want to thank him for that. As the ushers come forward to distribute the attendance pads, let me invite you to please fill those out. That is still very helpful for us. And let's stand and greet our neighbors in the name of Jesus. come now to a time of prayer in our service we will take a moment of private reflection and then we'll share in a congregational prayer and close with the Lord's Prayer will you bow with me please Eternal God, our one true hope for all the earth, prepare in us a warm and welcoming place where we may receive the King of Kings with gladness and kindness and faithfulness. In the center of our cr crowded days, create a quiet place of light and peace where we can keep these holidays as holy days that they were meant to be. Help us help those whom you hold in special care for the sake of their special needs. For them we ask gifts that only you can give. To those in mourning, to, to whom the sounds of merrymaking are agony, we ask that you would give a deepening awareness of your arms that surround them and the peaceful certainty that your other arm is around the loved one that they are missing. To those who are dying, let the peace of your coming surround and sustain them as the time of leaving draws near. Reassure their fearful hearts of your undying love and life. To those whose hearts are breaking and to those who are filled with sorrow and worry, 
Reveal how your coming brings power and peace in just such times as these. To those who are sick, open a window of insight so that they might glimpse the healing you plan for your whole creation and so await their own healing as well. For those who are out of work and near out of their minds with anxiety, go before them to open a path through their troubles that they may follow you to a brighter future. For those that are separated from loved ones, let their hearts experience the spiritual joy of concentrating their thought and worship upon you who so loved the world that you gave us your only son. You sent him not with ribbons and wrappings, but with power and grace. Whether we have been naughty or nice, you still sent your son. Receive our thanks, our praise, and our prayers for Jesus' sake. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom,
our scripture for today comes from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, verse, verse 46b through 55. And as a sign of respect for the Gospel, will you please stand as you're able, as it is read. Hear now the word of the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 230, O Little Town of Bethlehem. you bow once again with me, please. God of grace and God of glory, help us to hear your words today. In the midst of everything that's going on, let us hear anew of the gift of your Son. For it's in his name we pray. 
Amen. Bishop Will Williman went to Australia in 1996 during the summer, and he came across a Christmas hymn. Now, when we think of Christmas, generally we think of weather much like we have today. It's cold, there's snow sort of lying around, and there is a storm a coming. But it's not always that way all around the world. The name of the Christmas carol is Carol Over Christmas. Carol, excuse me, Carol Our Christmas. Carol Our Christmas, an upside down Christmas. Snow is not falling and trees are not bare. Carol the summer and welcome the Christ child, warm in our sunshine and sweetness of air. Sign of the gold and the green and the sparkle, water and river and lure of the beach. Sing in the happiness of open spaces, sing a nativity summer can reach. Shepherds and musters move over hillsides, finding not angels but sheep to be shorn. Wise ones making journeys, whatever the season, searching for signs of truth to be born. Right upside Christmas belongs to the universe, made in the moment a woman gave birth. Hope is the Jesus gift, love is the offering, everywhere, anywhere, here on earth. Now such a hymn seems strange to us. As I say, we're preconditioned by all the things that we've received about this Christmas season. And indeed, maybe that's why we need to look at the Christmas story and its predecessor once again. In reality, an upside-down Christmas was exactly what the first Christmas was. It turned the world upside down. It's not about a loving two-parent family values but an unwed mother named Mary. The good news is not gi given to bishops and pastors, but shepherds in the field. The babe is not put up in a castle, but more than likely in a feed trough. With Mary's words in our scripture for today, we can be reminded of the radical, re revolutionary words that she spoke and the radical, revolutionary fact of Jesus coming but it is also radical, revolutionary words of hope. Bishop N.T. Wright writes, Hope is what you get when you suddenly realize that a different worldview is possible. A worldview in which the rich, the powerful, and the unscrupulous do not, after all, have the last word. The same worldview shift that is demanded by the resurrection of Jesus is the shift that will enable us to transform the world. And it begins at an upside down Christmas. Our scripture for today is called the Magnificat, which is the Latin word for glorify. And indeed, it is what Mary is doing. She is magnifying or glorifying God, giving God the glory. Now, it is being spoken to Elizabeth. Remember, chapter 1 of Luke's gospel is largely about Elizabeth and Zechariah. And it's a familiar story through the Old Testament and beyond about an older woman not being able to have children. And she is blessed by God with a child. We've heard about the story of Abraham and Sarah. We've heard the story about Hannah and Samuel. And now at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we get Elizabeth and Zechariah. And she is the one that witnesses. And she is the mother of John the Baptist. Her part, much like Hannah, is to carry that child in old age and to be a witness as her son will be a witness after her. The Magnificat has two parts, personal thanksgiving and thanksgiving for the nation. Now, specifically in our reading today, Mary calls herself a handmaiden. Well, the New RSV, the New RSV uses the word servant and calls herself blessed. Now, in that day and time, being a servant is not particularly blessed. You have to do what someone else tells you all the time. There is no right to work. There's no right to anything. And yet, here's a woman in a world that does not revere women. 
A woman who is in an unfavorable state as far as most moral people look at her. And yet, in the midst of all of that, a powerless one, a one that will be looked down upon, is, recognizes that she is blessed because God is the one that puts down enemies. If we stop the story much like it is there, Mary will appear, appear somewhat like Elizabeth or Hannah or Sarah, that she's been blessed with a child. But there's one more thing. Mary is young and a virgin. So what this shouts out is that God is doing something entirely new. It still is. It is still entirely earth-shatteringly new. And we have domesticated it out of that shock value that it should have. It hasn't happened before. It hasn't happened since. It is an upside-down Christmas. A minister went to visit his children and grandchildren to celebrate Christmas. When he walked into the house, he noticed in front of him a beautiful nativity set. And his granddaughter came up to him and he asked her, do you know what that is? As he pointed to the nativity set. Yes, she replies, it's breakable. <laughs> In a very breakable world, God did a very unusual thing. A child whose mother is a servant came to make a difference for everyone. It truly, truly, truly was an upside-down Christmas. Now, there are a lot of lessons that we can draw, and perhaps you have drawn them for yourselves, but three lessons here that I want to point out. First, there is no reason for pride. In this passage, we are told that the lowly are raised and the powerful are brought down. And what that tells us then is that, that political power cannot save. Hear that, O oh Caesar. Hear that, political parties. It tells us that economics cannot save. Hear that, Wall Street. Hear that, fiscal cliff. It tells us that personal appearances cannot save. Hear that, fashionistas. Hear that, movie stars. But like the servant girl Mary, we must depend upon the Lord not on our own abilities or talents or anything else, but we must totally depend on the Lord. That's perhaps the hardest thing we Americans have to hear. Because we want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, because we want to accomplish sometimes, we need to hear that it isn't about us. It's about God. And that's the message of Christmas. Mary speaks as though it's already happened, as God is accomplishing it. And so God did, and so God is. It was the beginning of an upside-down Christmas. Yet we have to do practical things as well. Twelve ministers were on a flight to a conference in Seattle. Their plane hit turbulence, and one of the ministers jokingly told the hostess that he should go, she should go tell the pilot that they had nothing to worry about. They had 12 ministers on the plane. Later, after everything had settled down, the flight attendant came back and the ministers jokingly asked, well, what did the pilot say? She told him, she said, well, he was glad to have 12 ministers aboard, but he'd rather have four engines that worked. <laughs> While all of this is theoretical, this upside down Christmas thing, it's not. It's the reason we gather here each day each Sunday. You know, if you think about it, there, I am sometimes amazed that the church can do the things that we can do, like we still care about 26 folks that survived the massacre, that we still support starving children and people without water in the Sudan and Darfur, that we make a difference in people's lives. You don't have to be here. There's lots of things you can be doing. The NFL starts in 22 minutes. But somehow we recognize that there is a truth beyond what the world tells us. That maybe that first Christmas instilled with us those upside-down values. 
Secondly, there must be an end to the world's labels. There can be no separation based on prejudice and or prestige. Mary's words are words of a social revolution. All are valuable. Some are not more valuable than others, but all are children of God. That's based in the Old Testament concept of justice, where the people cared for the orphans, for the widows, for the homeless. And it was not the rule of courts, but rather treating all humans as creatures of God. Therefore, prestige and rank or, stand, and, or standing are all upturned by the coming of the Christ child. <coughs> and still we value things in an upside, in, in our way, we think a right side up, but maybe it's upside down. The story is of a young woman who was engaged to Mozart before he rose to fame. And she became more impressed with more handsome men. And she thought she became disenchanted with him because he was short. So she gave him up for someone tall and handsome. After the world began to praise Mozart for his outstanding musical accomplishments, she regretted her decision. She said, I knew something of the greatness of his genius, but I only saw him as a little man. You know, unfortunately, during this time of year, much of the world responds to Jesus in just the same way. They hear about the little baby and pay a bit of tribute and lip service to the little one, but soon he is forgotten and the relationship is broken. Indeed, many, because of labels, often don't understand. Thirdly, there needs to be no confusion. Mary's son, his words, his deeds, his miracles, his teachings, his passion, his death changed the world. It changed the world. Unfortunately, the world continues to try to change it back. We see this at this time of the year. Now we call it commercialism, but isn't it interesting where they even get to name their own days of the week? Black Thursday, or Black Friday, Gray Thursday, Cyber Monday. Isn't it interesting that we see Christmas as a time for family and there's nothing wrong with family, but that's not what Christmas is all about. Isn't it interesting where the, uh, where the ultimate question of materialism is, what did you get me? And even the idea of Christmas. As I was coming to church today, I was listening to the NPR station and talking about the origin of Santa Claus. Do you know how Santa Claus evolved? He evolved from the Dutch tradition and was brought into America and it really exploded at the beginning of the 20th century as a way to sort of tame it. Washington Irvin. Irving wrote about it, about the Santa Claus, because before then, even Christmas was outlawed certain places. Not because it was a religious celebration, but because it became the occasion when the fall wine and beer came into play. So it was against the carnival atmosphere. So they wanted to domesticate it. They wanted to make it safe. And I'm not sure that that's not what's going on today. Christmas is safe when you get to buy presents. Christmas is safe when you talk about greetings. Or you use the term happy holidays. There's, if somebody's not Christian, I don't mind that. But what I think we need to do is embrace the term Merry Christmas. Not as a general greeting, but as an, ev an evangelism one. It is extending what I believe, Merry Christmas as a way of sharing what is important to us. So when you look at it in much the same way, we are all living in that postmodern angst. And perhaps there is no better representative of postmodern angst than Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, the Christmas story is the greatest cartoon ever made. And in the midst of all that, and all the decorations, and all the hoopra, Charlie Brown says, can anybody tell me what Christmas is all about? And Linus, blanket and all, comes center stage and says, I'll tell you, Charlie Brown. And he recites Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. We need to remember 
not all that goes around us, but the origin of the day. And finally, in 1891, Robert Louis Stevenson, the famous author of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Kid Kidnapped, gave a rather odd gift to the daughter of a friend. His friend was Henry Ide, and his daughter was born on Christmas Day, and she complained that she never got a birthday party. Her, she, when she was 14 years old, Annie received this special gift from Robert Louis Stevenson. He came up with the idea of giving her his birthday. He drew up a legal document transferring all the rights and privileges of his birthday to her. His birthday fell on November 13th. And it says, to Miss Annie H. Hyde, from this day forward, you shall have your birthday as November 13th. And for the rest of her life, she celebrated her birthday on that day. Robert Louis Stevenson was not the first, though, to transfer the rights and privileges to someone else. In a sense, that was what Jesus did when he came for you and for me. The rights and privileges of eternal life. The rights and privileges to be called children of God. The rights and privileges to become his followers. In the midst of all that, I don't decry anything that we do. It's important to be with family. It's great to give gifts. But let's never forget that what we are celebrating is revolutionary. It is radical that God entered the world for you and for me. Every year, it should be an upside-down Christmas. Will you bow with me? Oh, Lord God, help us during the rush of the next two days to take a little bit of time and just reflect that, yes, oh God, it is an upside-down Christmas. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now respond by affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as you're able. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was crucified by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. continue to worship God with our tithes and our offerings. Oh Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your gift, your gift of your Son, Jesus. Please bless these gifts that we return so that we can further God's, your kingdom. Amen.
Sunday is in your United Methodist hymnal. One of the favorites of this season of Christmas, Joy to the World. It's number 246. with God's grace. Go now with God's peace. Go now and celebrate the birth of the Son of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>